researchers have done studies to show that people who regularly suppress their emotions tend to be stupider than people who don't. They're less observant, have trouble thinking through things clearly. And so the question is, when you're meditating, are you making yourself stupid? Well, it depends on how you meditate. But first you have to understand what it means to suppress an emotion. It means you deny that it's there. In other words, it's not that you're not simply expressing it, you're also trying to hide it from yourself. And in the walls of denial that go up in the mind where you hide things from yourself, that, that's what makes it difficult to think clearly, to connect things, to see relationships. It also takes a lot of energy to keep up those walls, which means you have less energy to observe things. So it's important as you meditate that you understand that you're not here to suppress an emotion, deny that it exists. You want to be very clear about what's going on in the mind. But at the same time, you want to learn how to use it wisely, approach it wisely. Now, there was in fear, greed, anger, delusion come up in the mind. It doesn't necessarily help to express them outside. Because sometimes that makes it difficult to observe what's going on, too. There's got to be a middle way between the expression and the suppression. And this is important as you meditate, because so many times you try to tell yourself, just be equanimous, don't get excited, don't get worked up about things. And then you try to convince yourself that that's the way it is. You see ideals of what an enlightened person is like, very calm and equanimous, and you try to clone the calm and clone the equanimity. And it's important that you remember that right cloning is not one of the factors of the path. The relevant one is right reference or right mindfulness. Having the right frame of reference for dealing with pain and pleasure as they come. If you view the pleasure simply as something you want to run towards or the pain as something or you want to fear or run away from, then you're creating a situation in which the emotions as they arise, the liking and the disliking, are going to get in the way. So what you want to do is create a different frame. Instead of seeing yourself as someone there who's partaking of the pain or partaking of the pleasure, you want to dismantle that perception. And also you want to have another way of approaching the pain and the pleasure, so you don't feel threatened by the pain, and you don't simply indulge in the pleasure. This is why you've got to have a technique as the foundation of your meditation. We've talked many times about how meditation is not just technique, but you can't meditate without the technique either. You need the technique in the context of certain values, certain understandings. But you can't denigrate technique either, because it provides part of your frame of reference. For example, you're dealing here with a breath, and you may notice that some ways of breathing are comfortable and some ways of breathing are uncomfortable. And then you begin to realize the connection between pain and the breath, pleasure and the breath. And because the breath is something that can be controlled to a certain extent, You've got your handle. You can try breathing in different ways. You can change the rhythm, you can change the depth. It can be heavy breathing, light breathing, broad or narrow. That's changing the, the mechanics of the breathing. You can also change your perception of the breath. When you breathe in, exactly what's happening, what's moving, and what's moving what. So many times we have cartoon ideas about exactly what the process is, and then that determines which muscles we're going to expand, which ones we're going to contract, what sensations we believe have to be a part of the in-breath, what sensations have to be part of the out-breath. But if you can learn how to question those presuppositions, you find that the breathing opens up. There are lots more possibilities. You can conceive of the body as a sponge. When you breathe in, there's energy coming in and out through every pore. And if you apply that perception to the breathing, you find the the physical sensation of the breathing is going to change as well. The rhythm is going to change. Or you can think of having an energy core that runs down the center of the body, and the in-breath comes into that central core, and then when it goes out, it leaves that central core. Or you can think of breathing in and out parts of the body that normally are not associated with the breath. You can breathe in and out your legs, for example, or breathe in and out your brain, or your hands. And as you explore your notions of the breathing, you find that a lot more varieties, and they also have different results in terms of feelings of ease or discomfort, pleasure or pain. And you find that patterns of tension in the body that you felt were necessary part of having the body sit upright or having the body breathe are actually not necessary at all. You can breathe through them and they begin to loosen up. 
And this leads you to explore other feelings of blockage or pain in the body. Say there's a pain in your knee. How much of that pain is actually the result of physical causes and how much of it is a result of the way you're breathing? You can experiment. And this way the technique gives you a different framework for looking at sensations of pleasure, sensations of pain. In other words, where there's pleasure, you realize that to maintain that pleasure, you can't just wallow in the pleasure and create a sense of yourself as gulping the pleasure down, because that usually puts an end to it. If you stay with the breath, maintain your perception of the breathing, you can maintain that sense of pleasure. That's a positive thing, after all. The pleasure that comes from concentration is one of the factors of the path, right concentration. And as for the pain, that becomes something you can approach with the tools you've learned from your technique. Try breathing through the tension around the pain. You can think of the breath, say if the pain is in your knee, you can think of the breath coming in and out right at the knee. Or you can think of it going down the leg through the pain in the knee and then, then out through the toes. Or if it's coming into the knee, you can think of it coming in from the, from the kneecap or coming in from the behind the knee. There are all kinds of ways you can play with your perception of the breath. And you'll find that they have an important impact on the actual feeling of pain and also your attitude towards the pain. You feel less threatened by it. You're trying to develop an attitude of being inquisitive, which, as the Buddha said, is how you approach the First Noble Truth. You want to learn, learn to comprehend it, and that requires that you be inquisitive about pain. Try to understand it. So the breathing technique gives you several important approaches for dealing with the pain. Instead of just sitting there and spinning out over the pain, thinking about, here I am sitting, hurting myself by letting my knee get all bent up like this. You can focus instead on, okay, what is the mechanics? What are the mechanics of the pain? How do they relate to the energy flow in the body? And with a comfortable breath sensation as your basis, say in some other part of the body where you've been focusing, it gives you a place that you can go. When the pain gets too much to handle, you've got a place you can turn around and run to. And when you have that sense of safety and security, then you feel less threatened by the pain. You're more inquisitive. And at the same time, you actually have tools that can lessen the pain. And because your attitude is one of being inquisitive rather than trying to push the pain away or squeeze it away, not only the mechanics of the breathing, but also your attitude is going to have a huge effect on how you experience the pain. There are cases where the change in attitude will make the pain go away. Or other times the pain doesn't go away, but it doesn't matter because you're not involved in trying to consume the pain or finding yourself forced to consume the pain. You're not a consumer anymore. You're an experimenter, inquiring into what is the nature of this pain and how much does the way you breathe affect the pain? How much does your attitude affect the pain? What are you doing to make the pain hurt the mind? Because after all, the pain is something there in the body. It doesn't have to hurt the mind. It's, we're doing unskillful things. We have unskillful attitudes, unskillful ways of relating to it that take the pain and put it into the mind. So we've got to turn around and look, okay, what are we doing that makes the, that turns the pain into suffering for the mind? So by creating this new frame of reference through the technique, you're not suppressing your fear of pain. You're just giving yourself a new frame of reference that changes your attitude towards the pain. So many times we believe that our emotions are a given, that they're purely visceral. They're not. They're, there's a lot of our unspoken attitudes or poorly articulated attitudes that have gotten buried in our, in our minds. A lot of unskillful habits of dealing with pain, say, that come from way back. And those are the things that fuel our emotions around the pain. They also fuel our emotions around the pleasure. And so as we create this new framework, We've been, we'll start stirring up some of those attitudes and calling them into question. Who is this me that's been devouring the pleasure and then suddenly finds itself devouring pain? Who is this consumer? And is it just consuming or is it also producing the pain, producing the pleasure? We we'll start questioning these attitudes and getting a clearer sense of what's actually going on, in which case you're not trying to clone enlightenment or you're not trying to suppress your emotions. 
just learning how to deal with them in a more intelligent way. And that way the meditation, instead of making you dumber, actually makes you more perceptive, better able to see relationships. It's not a matter of suppression. It's not a matter of pretending that you're awakened when you're not. It's just learning to be very frank about what's actually going on. But at the same time, learning how to question your assumptions of what seems to be the obvious about what's going on. So the meditation is not a process of programming you to be a, have a certain sort of personality or a certain sort of demeanor. It's a series of instructions for how to explore. So to, instead of piling more denial on top of the denial that's already there in the mind, you're learning how to peel it away and not to be afraid of it, not to be afraid of what you're going to find as you peel away, because you've got your tools to deal with whatever comes up.